Loretta Davis, the Trace Queen of the Blues here, and I want to invite you down the night before Thanksgiving to the Detroit Distillery's Whiskey Factory. This is an annual event. We're going to bring you whiskey, we're going to bring you blues, we're going to have a good time. You got to get your tickets early though, because last year we sold out. Said I'd given up on all right, we are back. We are back in the Detroit is different studios. And right now we're cozied up because it's getting colder outside. But we're used to that, Michigan. We used to that Detroit. And we have someone that definitely is representing whether it's cold, whether it's warm, whether it's raining, whether it's snowing. Mr. Ron Taylor, how you feeling today? I'm good. I'm good, my brother. I'm good. All right. And Mr. Taylor is someone that definitely is a... I would say colleague and friend in arms of one of my closest and mostest and Helen Love. And I originally met him. Uh, you see this striking tall black man walking through the hallways of uh Detroit area agency on aging. And then she's like, you have to meet Ron Taylor. So I shook his hand and I'm like, okay, so who is ron taylor and then she's like okay he is taking over for mr bridgewater who when we think d triple a in the city of detroit the legacy that mr bridgewater laid for decades is what so many people tied together and now carrying that legacy and then in new directions and creativity and taking on the ham of this organization it's mr taylor so mr taylor with that introduction, let's start with Detroit, because that's where Detroit is different starts. What's your tie to Detroit? What's what's your relationship with Detroit? Uh, my relationship with Detroit is um, formally has been through this job as okay. far as at the DAAA. And so I used to visit Detroit as a, as a youth and as a teenager and even, mm -hmm. even as a college student because I grew up in Toledo. Okay. And so, it's, you know, it's right down the road. So when we thought we were going to hang out or get somewhere, <laughs> things of that nature, we was coming to the D. Okay. Um, but formally, you know, I've been in Detroit now for about a year. Um, last week would mark my year. And I had to say, uh, Mr. Frazier, that you're so correct as related to it's been interesting because I've walked into a situation in which I'm replacing a legacy. Yes. And someone who is widely known nationally and also locally as related to his endeavors and what he's done in the field of aging. So, but I've been very fortunate also to um, have him as a colleague and someone to help into um, ingrain me or to introduce me to certain um, individuals in the community and also certain aspects of the community. Mm -hmm. And I've also been very fortunate to have individuals such as what you, uh, Helen Love, whom you spoke of, mm -hmm. to kind of give me the roadmap, give me some of the historical backdrop as related to this city and some of the very wonderful and marvelous things that has occurred and just the, the richness and the uh, vibrancy that this city offers. And so um, Helen has kind of introduced me through various books and conversations to the, the nooks and crannies of this city. So I'm truly loving my time. Uh, this past year has been great. OK, so when you talk about this past year and your connection, let's go back back to when you were driving up 75, just hanging out in Detroit. So I might was not be it... able to talk about those. <laughs> <laughs> it was like one of your friends was like, Detroit has some beautiful women. Women up there is fine. We got to drive up 75. <laughs> uh, but let me let me I give you this is how I tell you um, this is how uh a role in which Detroit played for me. Mm -hmm. um, actually, my first date with wow. my wife wow. uh, was here in Detroit at Fishbones. Mm. And we actually thought that we, I thought I was doing something big, okay. bringing her up here to Fishbones and um, like really showing her some, some, something special. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of ironic that it comes, it's come full circle that I'm back here mm -hmm. and, you know, and we can go to fish bones again. Okay. That's great. And let, let me say this for, for a lot of guys, fish bones is a, is a first date for many of guys. <laughs> so, uh, don't, don't hold back on it. Uh, it's many locations, but as far as I'm concerned, it's the downtown location, but that's me. I'm sure the management and ownership of fish bones say, well, you can still go to our Southfield and other location, but that's, that's what I think of when I think of it. 
Okay. You know? And that's the location we went to, the downtown oh, yeah. location. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure it was like, okay, this is, yeah, that that was mm-hmm. a distance of the travel. That probably set you, I'm sure she probably has a whole different take on it. Like, you know, when he took me here, I was thinking this, I was thinking that, you know. So that's definitely cool. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. So when we think of uh, the neighborhood uh, and being in and around, what has stood out about some of the things in the Detroit community uh, just as a person witnessing it and experiencing it from your position at DAAA? You know, it was, um, I have to say, you walk in Detroit, um, quite naturally I came in with the perspective and some of the things in which the media, as far mm-hmm. as how they portrayed the city. And, you know, I recall when I came in on my initial visit as far as interview, and I had an opportunity to essentially visit downtown Detroit. And I was struck by the um, architect and also the statutes and just the overall ambiance in which the city provides. And and at that time, I said, this act, the downtown Detroit, you could put up against any downtown in which I've, I have visited. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, you started venturing out into the to the communities and you see that um, there there are some issues as related to the 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 various pockets of the city and, mm-hmm. and just the economic differences in which you can which you can see. But one of the things which really struck me and which I've been most impressed with and which I'm loving about this city has been what I what I consider the soulfulness that overall um, the vibe that I get from the the citizens, I mean, individuals within the within the community. And it's kind of like a resiliency that gives mm-hmm. it a um, it's a it's, it's hard to describe, but it's. It's, it's it's like you know we are persevering, we enduring, but we still loving one another, and and everything mm. is still good, and so that's I'm I'm really appreciating that, and that's one of been that's probably been the major difference in which I've seen, and I love Atlanta where I came from, hmm. but um, it's something about being back home and that blue collar work ethic, mm-hmm. and just the pull up the boots, um, and we're gonna we're gonna support one another as we go along, also. Okay, so th- this character that you speak of in resiliency mm-hmm. is definitely something that I tie into when I hear so much about. And, you know, Detroiters, we have uh, people talk about the New York ego. We we, we have a little swagger to ourselves. You okay. know? We, we definitely feel as though, you know, the style and fashion and, and flair and even conversation, you know. But uh, another thing is my father is another Ohio guy. Okay. He's from Cincinnati. Okay. He was always saying, you know, when I came to Detroit, it's still kind of like a cliquish town. I feel like there are, there are many different subcultures mm-hmm. that exist here. Like it it not just you can't just say it's an art scene in Detroit. It's layers in the art scene. So have you have you touched and experienced uh, some of the differences and like some of the backgrounds and in some of these different like I would say groups or, or thought processes and philosophies. Um. I have not, I have not witnessed mm-hmm. that at this particular point in time. Um, okay. But I will say, I keep hearing about this East side, West side thing or this, <laughs> or this cash <laughs> Renaissance issue. But you know, I have, it, it, it really has not, it really has not um, come to me as related to where it's been, been anything noticeable. Yeah. As related to where I just, where it's kind of just stood out and I've said like, huh. It, it's, it's, it, it, uh. I think it's kind of the same. It's, it's kind of the same thing, but you know, okay. here in Detroit, we, you know, we will, uh, we will exa- exaggerate the 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 differences. But the East Side and the West Side, to me, <laughs> I'm pretty sure people are listening. Like, no, it's not. <laughs> but it's pretty much the same. It's pretty much the same feel. Yeah, you know, uh, one of the things in which it was like, what word is the dividing line? Yes. And, you know, I keep hearing, what word is the dividing line? And I'm still trying to figure out why is what word the dividing line? Yeah. I have not figured that out yet. Yep. And, uh, and this kind of goes back to uh, the makeup. And I'm not just, I don't think this is just Detroit. I think this is like many cities. As okay. we think about like the history of America itself. But for, for the longest of times, uh, Certain people just couldn't live 
past on, on other sides of Woodward. Uh, just due to mm. background, race, uh, religion, and some of those same dividing lines. And then also just the districting, you know, the way that uh, this is still a blue collar industrial town, mm -hmm. as Toledo is. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of that industrial work. So, you know, different factories are over here and a lot of the communities are made up by, you know, the the when I think of my community, High, Highland Park is okay. a stone's throw from here. Okay. So you think of the Model T plant mm -hmm. and Ford saw a vision for what Highland Park could be with mm -hmm. the with the schools, the churches, all based around auto manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So it, it became a Ford community. Right. You right. know, wearing wearing your uh, line coat. At one point in time, and even to this day, you know, you 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 start wearing your lion coat and your lion jacket. People will start, you know, shouting you out. You you know, people will start honking, <laughs> honking their car at you and everything. Like, yeah, there we go, there we go. You know, so I think that kind of plays a role. And, and then you know, the the culture divide uh, builds. And another one of the things that's unique about Detroit uh, when you really go back is some of the 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 states where people would be from right. would be populated from in certain streets and neighborhoods. So like, you know, certain parts of Black Bottom Detroit. Right. Nothing but people from Alabama. Right. Well, but you think about it and um you have to you have to you have to to me, you know, and kind of from being out coming mm -hmm. from the outside looking in. Detroit mm. has always been, it's kind of been like the northern um, Atlanta, or mm. it was the Atlanta before Atlanta. That's what that's what most Detroiters would be like. What you mean, yeah, northern Atlanta? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's because it's, it was that it was that um, it was that place in which it provided the economic opportunities, in mm -hmm. which a lot of our I know some of my people transitioned up from the from the south up mm -hmm. north, and you know stopped in Chicago, uh, St. Louis, Toledo. It's Detroit, Flint. Mm -hmm. And so, in, I mean, it's all over up in North. But what Detroit actually, what Detroit represented, it represented that gateway or that mm -hmm. opportunity for uh, a good income, for mm -hmm. uh, a stable family, for to to really to come up in some ways. And so, um, it's you think about the history and the vibrancy and just some of the things of which this city has offered. I mean, it's, it's truly amazing. And, you know, and, um, and it really kind of opened up my eyes too, when that movie came out about the riots that occurred mm -hmm. here in Detroit. And because you really didn't, you really didn't see things from that lens or even just the same issues that Detroit suffered as related to segregation and just the racism and things of that nature. Because from the outside looking in, it just appeared or just seemed that as a black person, that the opportunities in Detroit were so much greater than they were anywhere else. And I can say that like Chicago, Detroit definitely has its its challenges with race. Very, very staunch when you think about the segregation that's here. Uh, when you think of so much of this being a black city mm -hmm. is the fact that so many people did not want to live next to black people, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and that aligns itself uh, with other socioeconomic and political challenges. Uh, when when I look at a neighborhood like mine and this is definitely a neighborhood that a lot of people will say, oh, man, you're over there. And the. The culture over here, the richness, the families that I've known because I've been over here for so long versus some of the transient neighbors that live here now mm -hmm. and the poverty, the poverty that's so prevalent uh, in, in a city like Detroit, uh, especially for black families, presents some unique challenges. And you're dealing with the population in your organization that is all too often, I don't want to say forgotten, but not recognized with the same reverence mm -hmm. uh as sometimes teenagers or younger children mm -hmm. or even even current adults right uh what what do you find that call to action uh to to get that support for for an aging population uh in a city like detroit that's already having its challenges 
ga- grabbing resources for the city itself, for the infrastructure itself. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, we, we think of, of, of our, our sewer system and, and the age of that, our, our electrical lines and the age of that. Mm-hmm. How do we get internet throughout the city? But then it's something as simple as like, how do you make sure that this, you know, uh, uh, aging relative that may or may not still have family here in the city, make sure they eat every day, make sure they have access to certain resources. What has that been um, like for you thus far, connecting that message to people such as myself that may not even have it in the forefront of their mind? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And, you know, um, and I think it's a multifaceted um, response, response mm-hmm. and also approach. And part of it is that um, we're we're fortunate that through the federal government, they created what we call as far as the Older Americans Act. And so the Older Americans Act created agencies such as the Detroit Area HC on Aging um, through just, and there's like 600 plus um, triple A's throughout the country. And there's mm-hmm. 16 area agencies on AG in the state of Michigan. So we have a mandate to make certain that we advocate and that we coordinate services and that we fund um, or we develop a network of services to to address the issues as far as the um, aging populations in the communities in which we're established. But I will say the, the next part of it is that for myself, from a personal level, it has always been a passion of mine. I've always been... Um, I look at this, this is not a job for me. It's been a calling. Um, th- hmm. th- um, throughout my 30 years in my professional career, the only thing in which I've done is work in the aging network. So I've, you know, and and prior to that, just as a as a youth and as a kid, I was fortunate and I was blessed enough to have um, grandparents and then aunts and uncles and then other individuals that were older. And I would say at that point in time, they could be considered they, they could be considered senior citizens that took the opportunity to invest in me and to to. Um, you know, one of the things that I recall is they would always say is like, my son is setting, but yours is rising. And let me share some of my knowledge or wisdom with you. And as I look back at it, it really helped pave my journey as related to smoothing it out and helping me avoid some um, some knocks in which I probably would have, which I experienced, but Mm -hmm. not as many. And I just think it's incumbent as related to the quality of life. When you take a look at a city such as Detroit, that there's a number of individuals that are in need of services and need of support, but what they have to offer is just as valuable as far as what they need. And so it's incumbent upon us to bridge that, to stop taking a look at things from a generational perspective and taking a look at things from an individual perspective Hmm. and bringing them all together. And so I shared with you a little earlier is related to what, what I see and what makes it easy to help do our job here in Detroit is that those same individuals that are in need of services right now are those same individuals that have paved the pathway up Hmm. to this particular point in time. They're the same individuals that have given this community that resiliency. They're the same individuals that are contributing to the soulfulness of this community. And so it's easy to advocate for them and for others to be willing to step up to the plate to invest in them. So it's a, it's a, um, in, in the other aspect of which I would say is I would have to, again, have to give credit to Paul Bridgewater and my, um, his team and, and, and the other individuals that have served before me at the AAA and the number of partners and the number of, um, entities in which they've been able to bring together to raise the awareness on the needs of our individuals, to create programs such as our um, Holiday Meals on Wheels program, to continue to promote and to keep at the forefront the issues and the concerns and the needs of those that have paved the way before all of us. And when you talk about that connection, I'm just thinking as I've grown older, And in my own family, you know, uh, the people that are aging and building a different relationship. What has that been like for you? Because I'm I'm finding out so much more now as I've grown older and connecting more with my aging relatives. Like, you know, it kind of goes from, you know, child in need Mm -hmm. 
to now I have someone in a mentorship capacity Mm -hmm. to like that mentorship is now molding into a little bit of friendship Mm -hmm. and also listening without them saying anything because some of it is still it's well at least I know for like especially my grandma in Cincinnati it's a lot of pride Uh it's it's a lot of um you know certain things that she is comfortable with and what she's not comfortable with because I know her Right, right what has that experience been like for you having the mentors that you've had and as you've grown and watched them age and I'm sure some have passed on um uh, what was that like for you uh, looking at the people that were closest to you in their aging process? Um, it's, it's, it's really, it's been tremendous as related to the impact and the influence it's had on me. And I say, I say it from this perspective because um, growing up in a, um, I always tell folks uh, that song by Stevie Wonder, Living in the City, mm-hmm. that probably exemplifies my upbringing more mm-hmm. than every, anything, you know, and and was in a family that really, I mean, um, we had a great deal of love. And we wasn't poor, poor, but we wasn't rich and or anything mm-hmm. of that nature. But because of the, just the interaction and just the nurturing and support that, we we received from one another um, along with our aunts, uncles, and then also our grandparents, it really has helped shape me hmm. as related to the way I look at things and the way I want to treat others. And, and because, you know, one of the things which I shared with folks when I came here is that my management philosophy, but it's also my personal philosophy, is that of servant leadership. Mm-hmm. And that we're here to serve and we're here to help make one another better. And we're here to try to empower those that are around us. And I have to say a great deal of that was based upon what I received growing up hmm. from others. And, you know, I can recall, you know, uh, there would be those times or those moments where, you know, we talk about Big Mama and all that. And so we had we all got our own Big Mamas. So I had mine. And she would have a a bedroom, well, you know, the older she got, and she was kind of confined to her bedroom. But that bedroom was Grand Central Station. Hmm. Everybody was situated in that bedroom, and everybody was just there providing support and taking care of her and also receiving from her as far as those nuggets of wisdom. And so, you know, it, it's, it's, it, 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 re- it truly takes a village. Mm-hmm to raise or to, 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 to strengthen one another. And so that's, that's what I learned. And that's what has, um, has carried me forward as far as some of my life lessons um, in moving in, in, in management. And then also just as far as um, my role within the community. In in this age, as my mom did a lot of caretaking for her grandmother, mm-hmm. actually in this house, like in the other room, uh, and she was going through high school when this was happening. How old were you as you were began some of the caretaking for your grandmother? Um, it was a it was a family thing, but I think it was it was, you know, Carrie, it was kind of like. Um, you know how you have all of these family Thanksgivings and mm-hmm. all of these family get functions togethers and, and yeah. the functions and all of that. And one day, you know, my grandmother, she just stopped cooking. Hmm. She just stopped cooking. And she, she kind of just like put it, put it like I'm done. Mm-hmm. Uh, I won't be cooking anymore. People Thanksgiving. were like, okay, I want her dressing. Like, yeah, what is going and, on and, here? yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. But what was happening is she was passing the baton, hmm. but also she was letting us know that, you know, I'm getting older. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Grammy is starting to decline a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so that's when the transition started to occur. And I probably was, um, I probably was in my early 20s or things of that Hmm. nature. But the thing of it is, is that I wasn't the one providing the direct care. Because I had the aunts and uncles and and, and cousins and and things of that nature to step Mm -hmm. right in. But being able to sit back and witness, this kind of set the expectation is this is what we do. This is how we care for one another. This is what is expected of you. Mm. And, and brothers and sisters, because I'm guessing she probably had many, but how, uh, grandchildren. But uh, how mm-hmm. many brothers and sisters do you have? 
I have two sisters. Okay. I have two sisters. Older, we, younger. Uh, they're both younger than me. We're, okay. We're like um, steps. We're one year apart. So, okay. Um, so we're we're very close, and but we all went through our own caregiving situation with my mom, hmm. and I was actually residing in Florida, so I, I have enough perspective as related to the long distance caregiving, but then also the dynamics of caregiving, and you know, and I have to say that it was again one of those things which I'll say to me it just exemplified or it just um, illustrated how what love looks like when you're caring for another one. And I say that because I had a sister who's a nurse who actually moved out of her home or gave up her home to move in with my mother Hmm. to provide the care for my mother. Wow. And and during that time, that's, Mm -hmm. that's the other perspective of it is making sure that you can care for the caregiver as well. That's correct. That's, that's huge. That is huge. Um, because you know, um, there's a there's a lot of um, thought to the fact that as far as caregiver burnout and depending mm-hmm. upon what the issue is uh, for that the person is providing care for, whether it's um, someone that's ill mm-hmm. or, you know, maybe cancer or stroke or some other type of uh, um physical ailment and I would include then those physical ailments uh vary also because you can have someone that may be suffering with um, a diagnosis as far as, um, all, I mean, Alzheimer's or something of that nature. And it could be a very taxing responsibility because these individuals also have their own responsibilities in which they're taking care of. They may have children or they may have jobs themselves. So this is an additional job in which they've embraced. And so you know, that's why I say caregiving is such a um, selfless act and yeah. it's such an act of love. And I, I'm just and it's sometimes even even in the whole thought process of it, you know, um, it is changing some of the relationships as my mom passed. And no, I, nobody expect my mom to pass. It was so sudden. But she played a role in a lot of my family's life. Mm-hmm. So in that now I'm a little more present in more of my family's life and with it and i'm finding out that too like the the that difference like i said you you know you look up to a person like this is my grandma and then you start hearing these stories of like oh but my grandma was a teenager at one point not saying like i'm forgetting you know what i'm saying like you knew it but then you hear it and then it's like okay okay i probably would be friends with my grandma if we were like the same age like we would hang out together or something you know Uh so and and that's been like a a interesting experience as well you know yeah yeah man that's one of the that's one of the beautiful things of family and one Mm -hmm. of the beautiful things of uh you know it's like that old saying um uh was that at some particular point in time the child becomes the parent Mm -hmm. and but to sit back and to you know as far as the to see the relationships change and to see where like a parent becomes a friend Mm -hmm. and then then you can start to really get an appreciation as related to how that parent was as an individual and you can humanize that parent and you come to find out and you say like grammy you did what yeah exactly (laughs) or or, you know (laughs) or you know it'd be like somebody another family member be like oh i remember when um when such and such was doing such and such and you'd be like Nah, get out of here. And uh-huh. then, you know, and it kind of just humanizes and be like, but she got on me for this. And, uh, yep. and you know, and, and it's like, that's like why that. she got on you yeah, for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's I do the, yeah. I do the path yeah. it would take. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and that's, that, but that's the beautiful part about it, too, man. And it's, um, it's, it's one of those things in which, uh, when you can get to that point and you can, and you can grow in your relationship where you can see the humanness. Mm-hmm. and one another that's 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 a beautiful thing and, and even like the signals of some of these processes uh you know i'm growing and, and this is part of it as they say you know doctors practice medicine that's why mm-hmm. they're practicing but it, i'm even learning that 
you know, in, in certain diagnosis, you know, you're sitting with oncologists and it's like, okay, so is this cancer or is this not cancer? And, and what's going on? And you you saying stuff like this to my great aunt is going to raise her anxiety a thousand fold as it should. Because, mm-hmm. you know, if somebody said that to me, like, I mean, it's, it's hard to just, you know, be like, okay, so I'm going to just go get a pizza after this. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It's hard to, you know, shift back into life. But that's where that friendship connection, you know, the the laughs, the that's right. the the love, the the hugs, the connection kind of can build a stronger bond. And that's the beauty of it, because it's hard to just step in when, quote unquote, I guess a crisis is happening without already having a, a built relationship. Um, that that exists so it's not like even though they're family that's kind of a stranger because you you know it's mm-hmm. like you're there just because it's a crisis it's mm-hmm. not there just because you're always there mm-hmm. and you know and it's um that that is so true and it's one of the things um as you were speaking that kind of came to my mind but that's one of the beauties also is related to just a journey in which we can mm-hmm. travel with individuals um is to experience the valleys and the, the highs and lows and to, because I, I really believe that um, throughout life, um, relationships, friendships, and everything else, they're strengthened through adversity. They're strengthened when you could come through challenges and there's a stronger bond and there's a stronger commitment that, that results from such. And, you know, and it's the same with family members and with parents and with, even with grandparents. And, and, One of the things which I take a look back at as far as myself at this particular point in time is there might have been times like with my mom or my dad in which I didn't necessarily understand or necessarily even agree with what they were saying or where they were coming from. But I can sit back now and I can kind of chuckle as far as on the memories of it. Mm -hmm. And I can draw strength and I can draw inspiration and I can draw wisdom and say, I feel you now. Mm -hmm. I understand. Um, I didn't understand then, but I do now. And, Mm -hmm. and that's to me, that's the, that's the beauty of the journey in which we're on. And and you're a father as well. Yes. So, uh, how many children? I only have one child. Okay. Okay. Your daughter. That's correct. You mentioned her the the other week. Mm -hmm. What, what's her, what's her take on Detroit? Um, at first, um, she, only thing she was born in Ohio, Uh but, um, she has no recollection of Ohio except mm-hmm. us visiting for Thanksgiving and Christmas and other holidays. Or oh, family. So she reunions. grew up in Atlanta. So she grew up in Atlanta. That's oh, correct. So like, it is freezing here. Hold on. Today. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta give it. Yeah, but you know she has. Um, she has. She to my surprise, she has embraced it. She has embraced the community. She's um she's enjoying it, but I'm really I'm really waiting to see what's going to happen when she has to put on that uh the put, put on that uh, that put on the un- uh, long johns and things of that nature and and deal with mother um, deal with mother nature. Okay, and your wife, how does she uh she connected with it? Oh, uh, she loves it. She loves okay. it. You know, my wife is originally from Dayton, Dayton, Ohio. Okay, and she's so used to it. She's used to it and she's um I met her in Toledo, so she had lived in Toledo for quite a, a number of years also. So um she she's a northern girl, so she's accustomed okay. to it. Oh man. So whenever I meet your wife, I'm gonna be like, All right, now did you ever see the Ohio players before they were the Ohio players? And I'll be <laughs> and uh, she would probably be able to tell you, yes, she did. Oh uh, man. And the reason I say that, and the reason I say that is because uh I have uh we have a brother in law who was just inducted into the um like the disc jockey, I forget the exact title, but it's like the um like a hall of fame. The hall of fame. Wow. Yeah, it was in the state of Ohio. Oh man. So he would always he was an icon in the city of Dayton. So, you know, and then then and Dayton and the music scene is considered at one time was considered Chocolate City. Yeah, because you had uh, Steve Arrington, mm-hmm. Ohio Players. Yeah. Uh, uh, you had a Zap. Line. Yep, Zap. and um, yeah. yep, and then that's uh, that's correct. It's uh, mm-hmm. what was that? The Heat Wave. Yep, heat and wave. so yeah, yeah, so you know you would see a number. He would be able to get tickets to a number of shows and a number of acts. So I'm quite certain she could say that she she's met the. Um, 
the some of the acts or some of oh, the man. some of the players from Ohio plays. I was, also Lakeside. Yeah, Lake. I was uh, wondering. Like, yeah. I had a uh, I had a stats professor that was from Dayton. I was like, uh, what What was in the water? It's like this city ain't <laughs> even that big. It's like all this funk was coming out of yeah, like one. Yeah. Like this was like the home of funk. <laughs> yeah, it, it really was at one point in time. But you know that. See, but. I mean that's that's the amazing thing about the like I'll say Ohio, mm-hmm. uh, Michigan or Detroit, mm-hmm. uh, Dayton and then Toledo yeah. to some respects. There's a whole lot of talent, a oh, whole yeah. lot of a whole lot of um, just just a wealth of of uh, vitality in our community that just emanated out of these communities. Definitely. This was a great discussion. We'll definitely look to uh, have you back. I look forward to, like I say, definitely uh, picking your wife's brain as I love as much as I love hip hop. It's my favorite art form. Funk is up there like as a second. But, it, you know, hip hop is like a, 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 a offspring of it. In the music. Well, I heard uh, when I came in, I heard you listening to Teddy Pendergrass and I mm-hmm. said, now that might be outside this generation. So, oh, yeah, my mom, <laughs> that's that's my mom and my dad. OK, listening to uh, a lot of different stuff. And my mom loved that Motown, which is a different which is a different feel. But my dad mm-hmm. from Cincinnati, he liked more of that funk. He liked more of the slide, more of the Ohio players, more of, you know, Zap, more of like the, you know, and, and Boots, obviously George Bootsy Clinton. Collins, Bootsy Collins from, from Cincinnati. Cincinnati. Yeah. It, it, mm-hmm. his, uh, it's funny. My dad's like playmate friend <laughs> was uh, one of Bootsy's drummers at one point in time. Okay. You okay. Know, in that yeah. band that where James Brown just kicked everybody to the side. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. All right. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. Black revolutionaries, distillery owners, Italian fashion retailers, and Motown Grammy winners all share their best stories never before told in any other media outlets on Detroit is Different. Visit DetroitIsDifferent.com or download the Detroit is Different app on Apple's App Store or Google's Play Store.